Good morning, church. How are we doing? Good to be with you this morning. Hey, I wanted to um, read to you a couple of the comments that our kids have been making in these study guides. Just, again, so blessed this past week um, looking at these. Congratulations to Phoebe um, for being our June winner. And at the end, I don't know if um, some of you parents or, or those of you without kids, but they've got true false, they've got multiple choice. But then at the end, they have kind of a, in your own words, what's the most important thing you learned in the Bible, in our Bible study today? So I just wanted to share a couple of these with you. Uh, this young lady says that opening the Bible is not a waste of time, even if you don't understand what it means at the time. In other words, it's never a bad time to open up the Bible. Awesome. Uh, this um, young lady says, we have an incredibly dangerous, awesome ability of freedom. We need to be careful not to deceive ourselves. Okay. I mean, there's some great theology here. This young man says, how much God loves us and that we should do this. How much God loves us. And, and here's another one. This is how much God loves us. So uh, this, this guy's really got it dialed in. You know, we... Uh, it, it's amazing to, for them to week in and week out just feel high, the, the love of Christ. I, I just love this stuff. Um, this young lady says, The image of the potter and clay reminds me of how God created the world. It shows that he made everything perfect to fit into his plan. Also, before you make the clay an object, you have an image of what it will become, like how God has an image of us when he created us. I mean, it, it's amazing what, what they can retain and learn. Um, this one says, uh, the most important thing that I learned is that Jesus can even redeem and restore the mistakes we make. I mean, isn't that beautiful that, that this is what is getting sown into our kids, okay? Um, I, I, just, I just love it. This one here says, in your own words, what's the most important thing from our study today? That the book of Revelation is a book of God's love, and, and, and it's not a book to fear uh, that the end is coming. If I'm not getting God, I'm getting ripped off. Hoo All right. I, and then it says, thank you. I love that one. Uh, this one says, uh, just a couple more, that Judas was not a believer. I always thought he was, but didn't really care. Um, <laughs> But when you said Satan cannot enter into a, the body of a believer, it all began to make sense. And that clicked with me, that our kids are making sense of the scriptures. What, what a beautiful thing. Uh, but I wished he would have repented so he could have uh, enjoyed the beauty of heaven and God. Thank you, John. Now that one gets an extra point. Uh, I liked all of this so much that I don't really have a most important point, but I would say everything that you talked about between verses 7 to 9 about spiritual deception. So that was great. And then um, finally, and this one tickles me, um, in your own words, what's the most important thing? We have to delight in God and trust in him for everything. Awesome. And then there's a little picture below of Dad sleeping on the chair. And it's got the narrative cloud with all the Z's on it. We'll, we'll, we'll be praying for that Dad here uh, in the near future. <laughs> um, but anyway, I just wanted you to see um, how, how just these kids, they're, they're getting it. They're retaining it. And, and we're sowing um, sound doctrine into our children. And, and that just thrills me to no end. So I um, wanted to, to kind of share that with you. For the rest of us, um, good morning. If you're new with us, we'd like you to have a Bible. There are um, those available in the, the Welcome Center. Uh, please consider that a gift to you. Uh, let's go ahead then and open our Bibles uh, this morning to Luke chapter 22, 22nd chapter of Luke's gospel. We are making our way verse by verse through Luke's gospel. We're, we're heading into the final turn here. Uh, just a couple of chapters to go. We made it down to verse 63 the last time we were together. That's where we'll pick it up today. Luke 22 and verse 63. Now, right out of the gate here, let, let me tell you up front, this is going to be a, a tough couple of weeks for us. If you are a lover of Christ, if, if Jesus is the one to whom you attach the greatest value to, if, if Jesus is preeminent in your affections, this is going to be a tough couple of weeks. There, there's really no way around it. And look, man, if you're not there yet, my prayer is that what we're going to lay witness to here, my prayer is that you are profoundly struck 
by just what it is that the one who seeks to save your soul endured uh, in order to do just that. Now, when I say this is going to be tough for us to go through, what I mean by that is maybe a little bit different than what you think. I, I think the tough part is this. If, if we want to study the Word of God, if I want to get out of it what God would have me to get out of it, man, I, I've got to come to the Word of God as I would a mirror. I have got to let it reflect the truth of what it is that is in my own heart. I've got to come at this with integrity and with honesty, which means I can't just come uh, at this as an observer, but a participant. I can't just be an observer, but a participant. I've got to put myself right in there. You know, what we have to remind ourselves of uh, from time to time as we, we read the passion narrative is that, that your sin and my sin, uh, our sin collectively, is what necessitated the events that we have before us. Jesus didn't just die for the first century and proceeding. On one level, I think we get that. But we have to recognize that, that we are participants in the human depravity, the human sin condition that necessitated the passion of Christ uh, culminating in the cross there at Calvary. Now, uh, of course, we're going to see the usual cast of characters here, the Jewish leaders, the Roman soldiers, Pilate, Caiaphas, all of the rest of these guys. They had supporting roles, if you will, in the passion and in the crucifixion. But ultimately, none of these guys play the starring role in the drama here. That position is occupied by human sin alone. As we talked about a couple of weeks ago now, um, in the account there uh, of Christ at Gethsemane, man, if I, if I am to have any um, transformative victory over the sin in my life, if I am to mature as a child of God, I, I have to develop and, and cultivate and, and come to have a kind of just holy hatred for sin. I, I have to feel the weight of my sin. I, I have to feel the affliction of sin. And I think a big part of um, feeling that weight is coming to grips with my own part in putting our Savior up on that cross. You know what's interesting? Uh, if you've seen the movie The Passion of the Christ, you may or may not know that Mel Gibson, who directed it, uh, take a look at this. Uh, those were his hands that you actually see driving the nails through Christ. He did that to remind himself, and indeed you and I, that it was our sins that nailed Christ to the cross. Now, we're not bringing this to beer here to do some kind of a drive-by guilting on you. That is not what we are doing. But what is produced when what is produced when we begin to feel the weight of sin is just a heightened and elevated sense of wonder and worship and thanksgiving for just what it is that Jesus did for you and I. Now to feel the weight of sin, there's a kind of suffering that, that we enter into, right? There's a kind of, um, clearly we're not bearing the passion in a physical sense, right? But, but, but not, none of us here could endure that. But, but if we can allow ourselves, uh, um, heighten our sensitivity, if you will, to kind of spiritually walk through this, and kind of enter, allow our hearts to just enter into this, I, I think we will walk away again with just a greater appreciation. Speaking of suffering, Peter says this specifically in 1 Peter 2. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Now, nobody's going to the cross in the next couple of weeks, right? Thank God for that. We get that. But again, if we can somehow in our hearts just try to walk with the Lord and, and follow in his steps and just enter into this and, and give ourselves into the narrative here, I think there's tremendous spiritual profit that awaits um, for you and me. And, and, and we have done that. We, we've begun that already, right? Right? Only now, it's going to begin to take a very difficult 
turn. We've seen the rejection of his own people. We've seen the betrayal of Judas. We've seen the denial of Peter. And so we've seen the rejection. We've seen the betrayal. We've seen the denial. And now we have the physical abuse before us. Now we come to the physical abuse. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Now, from time to time, you and I, I believe, need to face the reality of the terror that Christ endured. From time to, well, there are seasons in which God has ordained that, that you and I revisit the passion of his son, that we, that we press into what the word of God has to say about the final hours in the earthly life of Christ. This is where we are in the text. And so I am taking it by faith that this is the season for this local body of believers to do just that. So we want to be faithful in the next couple of weeks to enter in. And so we're going to walk through this. We're going to feel the weight of it. It's going to get tough, but man, we are going to rejoice. We are going to rejoice on the other side of this. It's going to be that much sweeter, that much more awesome for having entered in. Were it not for the cold and hard of winter, how is it that we would rightly appreciate the coming of spring? So let's get after it and go to work then. Verse 63 now of chapter 22. Verse 63. Now, the men who were holding Jesus, a bit of a misnomer there. He's not being held against his will, right? Now, the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him and beating him. This word for beating there, this is dero in the Greek, and it has the idea of a a violent beating of the flesh, a a violent slaying of the flesh, verse 64. And they blindfolded him and were asking him, saying, prophesy, who is the one who hits you? And they were saying many other things against him, blaspheming. Now, now Luke here, Luke really forces us to do quite a bit of homework because Luke jumps right from Peter's denial, where we left off last week, and slams right into the tail end of Jesus' second trial before Caiaphas. Now, this is not pretty, what we have being described here, and we'll get back to it in a bit. But if we're going to make sense of the events that we have before us, I need to sort of take a step back here and and, and try to set the table for you that we might gather our bearings and have a a sense for where we're at in the narrative. So so let's just take a minute and set the stage here. Now, uh, what we have here is that Jesus is going to get jerked around through six different trials on his way to the cross. And uh, here's a snapshot summary. Let's bring this up on the screen. Note takers, don't bust in a frenzy here. I'll leave this up for you at the end if you're interested. Uh, you can Google this and look at it 47 different ways, all right? But just stay with me here. I want to kind of uh, lay this framework before you and use this as a kind of outline to lay out what it is that is before Christ. Now, there are essentially three Jewish trials, three religious trials, which are going to be followed then by three civil trials, three secular trials before Rome. So you've got three church trials, and then you've got three criminal trials is what you've got going on here. Now, as you might expect, if you've been paying attention, because Luke is writing to a Gentile audience, he's not writing to Jews, right? He really, Luke really compresses, hyper compresses these Jewish trials. In fact, he doesn't name the first two by name at all. He takes us where we're at in the text. He, he takes us to the tail end of the second trial before Caiaphas, okay? Takes us to the second end of, of that. And so what we're going to do here is uh, I would like to briefly walk through kind of how these trials fit into the events that, that we've already seen and have, have, have seen, or, or will see, rather. And so um, just as it makes sense that Luke might compress the Jewish trials because he's writing to a Gentile audience, it would stand to reason that it would make sense that he would expand the trials before Rome a little bit because he's writing to a Gentile audience. Let, let, let's narrate a little bit through this outline Put it in a kind of sequence for you. Here's what we've got, and here, here, kind of here's where we've been, here's where we're going. Now, upon the arrest at the garden, you remember, John chapter 18 tells us that they bring him first before 
Annas. Now, Annas as a mob boss is what he was. I mean, he was the former high priest. Rome had deposed this guy about 20 years earlier. Uh, he, is, he is really the kind of kingpin of this corrupt Jewish money-making machine in the temple there. And although he was deposed, although Annas was deposed, the guy's no dummy. He had all five of his sons succeed him as high priest. And Caiaphas, where we're going to go next, his son-in-law, is the current high priest. So what has this guy done? Well, he's kept this rip-off racket in the family, right? I mean, he has kept this money-making machine in the family, and he is kind of the godfather over this entire operation. And so Jesus, straight from the garden, he's marched right before Annas, where the godfather kind of gives his blessing, and he pronounces the sentence, yes, we have to kill this man. Now, next, after that hearing before Annas, he's marched across the courtyard from Annas' house to this kind of mock trial at the house of Caiaphas. And this was the scene of Peter's denial we read about the last time we were together. Peter's hanging out in the courtyard there, uh, denying Jesus while he's in before Annas. Just as that trial concludes, he's being led, Jesus, he's being led out of the courtyard. Peter denies Jesus for the third time. Jesus and Peter lock eyes, the rooster crows, stunning timing, sovereignly orchestrated by God, and Peter is just wrecked there. He, he is wiped out. Now, what we have then, and this is what the, the second trial is what Luke just breezes right past here. Doesn't talk about it, right? And, and all of this, this mock trial before Caiaphas, uh, understand that all this is is basically a, a, um, a, an official, it, it is a rehearsal for this official religious trial that they're going to have before the Sanhedrin. So trial two is nothing more than an illegal rehearsal to prepare for trial three. Okay? And, and we'll get to that in the text this morning. But at the end of this illegal mock trial, they begin to beat Jesus as they're holding him. But at the end of trial two, not yet to trial three, they're holding him and, and, and beating him. And, and this is where Luke picks it up in verse 63, where we drop in today. And so now, verse 63 here, his agony begins. But I want you to see the timing. We had the denial. He went before Annas. He's getting beat at the end of this Caiaphas trial. And, and then he's going to go to trial three before the Sanhedrin. Luke jumps right to the end of the second trial where we have the beatings recorded in Luke 3. So his agony begins, verse 63. He's in police custody. The trial before Caiaphas has come to a close. They've blindfolded him. He doesn't see the direction. These clo and by the way, Mark tells us that the punches that he's getting here, they're close-fisted. All right, And so he doesn't see the direction in which these closed-fisted punches are coming at him. A barbaric, barbaric beating happening here. He takes it directly. Uh, you can imagine now how quickly his eyes are beginning to swell. Uh, you can imagine his nose is probably broken. Uh, now, again, the prophecy was not a bone in his body was to be broken. But, but the nose, we understand, that's cartilage, not a bone. But, but he's no doubt finding it very difficult difficult now to breathe, breathing very heavily now out of his mouth. Look, I, there's no way to exegete this text. I mean, I can't just come to this and, okay, how do I expositionally approach this text with the pro proper homiletics? Look, it, this is just barbaric is what it is, and it, it's going to get worse. For my part, man, I want to feel the weight of of what my creator and savior went through. I, I can't even imagine that. Now, if you're a boxer or you're a football player, you can see the hits coming, right? I mean, what would it be like to have a, a bag over your head blindfolded with just closed fist after closed fist just repeatedly beating him in the head and in the face? And the other Gospels tell us before they blindfolded him, they were spitting in his face and they were slapping him. It's just, just an abject humiliation. Imagine what Christ was going through. Abject humiliation and absolute 
torturous, horrific beating that he can't see coming. I mean, again, even if you're in a fight, I mean, and when you see what's coming, you can brace or whatever, but it just he's getting pummeled from every direction with, with no, no vision of this. I, I just can't enter into fully what, what that would be like. I, I just don't know. And yet, Peter tells us this. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. When you look at the passion of the Christ, and and man, this is just the beginning. I mean, the sheer volume of physical pain that he endured, all of this was a kind of physical foreshadowing of the spiritual horror that would come his way upon being separated from the Father, having all of our sins laid upon him. All of this physical pain he is enduring is the word of God's way of showing you and I just how brutal this forthcoming spiritual assault would be. We would have no other way to see it. Do we understand that? Tim Keller, uh, just last week, in fact, Tim Keller said this. He said, we are regularly in danger of having too light of a view of our sin and too light of a grasp on what Jesus has done to free us from our sin. That's why we want to enter in. He did this for you. He did this for me. Why? The writer of Hebrews tells us, For the joy that was set before him. What joy? The joy of rescuing rescuing you and and being with you and enjoying sin-free, despair-free, just pure and good and sweet fellowship with you for all of eternity in a place with no walls and no darkness. I mean, that's why he did it, to rescue you, to just be with you, to enjoy you and share everything he has with you, world without end of discovery and delight. Romans eight seventeen. we are joint heirs with the Son of God. Do we get that? Man, we're, we're going to get back to that in the coming weeks, I guarantee you. He did this for the joy of eternal fellowship with you. Now, a couple of quick words, seeing as he's getting jerked around through six trials here, a couple of quick words about the Jewish legal system so that you have a kind of background with which to see um, just how um, malicious this is. I I wish we had more time to roll this out, but the system of jurisprudence um, practiced by the Sanhedrin, the governing body of the nation at the time of Christ, understand this system was awesome. I mean, it was unequaled in its day and in many respects even to this day. It is, you know, there was a kind of um, divine expectation that that hovered over their legal system, all, all of which was rooted in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, that there were incredible systems of checks and balances designed to ensure integrity. There was an emphasis upon justice and truth and and particularly mercy. As an example, in the 70 voting members of the Sanhedrin, when a sentence was required to be passed, they would start with the youngest members and then proceed to the oldest. And they did this in the interest of justice in order to ensure that the younger members were not influenced by what the older members had to say. Very careful about that. They would never convene a trial late in the afternoon or the evening, certainly not under the cover of night, because they didn't want the pressure of time to corrupt a potentially unfair pronouncement upon the defendant. They themselves as a body could never bring forth a charge, but there had to be multiple corroborative witnesses and they had, man, they had this system of screening out potential false conspirators. That, it was just utterly impressive. We could go on and on. Very, very impressive system of jurisprudence. 
What I want you to understand is just the brash um, uh, injustice and illegality of these mock trials before Annas and Caiaphas. The illegality of these proceedings was, was stunning. They were held in the middle of the night, between 3 and 5 in the morning, right? They were not done publicly. They themselves brought forth a charge after bribing false witnesses. Everything about these trials before Annas and Caiaphas, everything about this was illegal by their own law. Their, their entire system of jurisprudence has just been butchered in every, every conceivable way here with Christ. And these guys knew it. They had practiced this system for decade after decade. Jesus knew it. Man, read the account of this in Mark chapter 14 this week. They're trying to coordinate these false witnesses, and these idiots can't get their story straight. That's in the text. I mean, this whole deal is a joke. Now, again, the whole point of this trial before Caiaphas, it was nothing more than a dress rehearsal for what we're about to read. This was Caiaphas running around desperately in the middle of the night trying to get all the guys together. Let's get our story straight because as soon as day breaks, just as soon as day breaks, then they can have their um, formal legal trial before the Sanhedrin. So this trial before Caiaphas that Luke skips to and gets to the beatings at the end of, that trial, uh, it, it, it's, it's illegal, it's a joke, it's nothing more than a rehearsal. Let's get our story straight. Here's what we're going to say tomorrow at the official trial, and, and let's just see what Jesus says and, and how he's going to respond. Well, now it's daybreak, and just as soon as the sun comes up, these guys want to get this trial rolling before as many people wake up as possible, all right? Now, here's Luke's presentation of trial number three, the formal trial before the Sanhedrin, verse 66. When it was day, and you might have uh, as soon as it was day, or you might have at daybreak in your translation, uh, there's an expression of urgency in the Greek text here. When it was day, the council of elders of the people assembled, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council chamber, saying, this would have been the chamber of the hewn stone for some of you uh, temple historical people. That was a, a piece of the temple that's a, 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 a courtroom that was attached to part of the temple. And so they meet there. Uh, if you are, so this is the formal trial at the temple before the Sanhedrin. This is what they practiced for. Verse 67. If you are, underline this, the Christ, Christos, the Messiah who saves, one of three very important titles that we're going to get here. I want you to underline one of three very key terms here I want you to dial into. So if you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask a question... You will not answer. Guys, we already had this at your rehearsal dinner, all right? Look, we think we do our thinking in our head, don't we? And to a real degree, that's true. But the Bible says we do our thinking in our heart. In other words, you decide what you want. You decide where you're going to land. You decide what you want to do with your heart. Your heart then commands your brain to do the reasoning necessary to justify the position you want to take. That's what these guys have already done a long time ago, right? Their corrupt hearts wanted this guy dead, and now all of their reasoning is to fall in line with the decisions that they've made in their heart. And that goes away, that goes against the grain of what the world presents, right? We actually think with our heart, and then we use our brains to reason to support what it is we want. Now, verse 69. But from now on, and this is Jesus still speaking, hey, you're not going to believe me. If I ask a question, you will not answer. Verse 69, but from now on, the Son of Man. There's our second of three key terms there. Underline that. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. In verse 70, notice they all said, so I mean all 70, well actually 71 guys, the high priest was a tiebreaker. So all of these guys, now all of them, they're, they're in an uproar. Are you the, here's our third term, Son of God? 
So we've got the Christ, the Son of Man, and the Son of God. You'll see where we're going with this. And they all said, are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, yes, I am. Again, ego iami, the name of the eternal God, ushered forth in the burning bush, verse 71. Then they said, what further need do we have of testimony? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. He is claiming to be God. They understand this. Now, get this. Understand that they had this whole deal planned out. The reason for this now official trial, the mock trial was to get ready for the official trial. The reason for the official trial is to get ready for the Roman trial. So that when Pilate asks, what are you coming to me for, man? Am I a Jew? Have you run this guy through your own own, own court system? They can say, well, yes, we have. But you see, they can't kill him because Rome did not allow the Jews to carry out capital punishment. And so this whole deal is nothing more than a a rehearsed show, a hurdle, a kind of hoop they have to jump through to legitimize then their bringing him before Pilate uh, for capital punishment. And now again, this trial is essentially just a repeating of the trial before Caiaphas with a few nuances. Again, you can read about that, Matthew 26, Mark 14. And by the way, Mark's gospel, I think, is particularly revealing there. And so here now, you have this pre-rehearsed trial going essentially exactly as planned so they can now get it on the books officially. Now, for you and I, I think this can be um, incredibly instructive concerning the gospel, that we can really develop our theology of the gospel, particularly with the way Christ answers here. Now, again, we've got three key terms I want you to dial into. We've got the Christ We've got the Son of Man, and we've got the Son of God. Now, we've heard all those from time to time, right? How does this all fit together? Now, the Son of Man, this is a messianic term out of the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 7. This was one of Jesus' favorite titles to apply to himself because it emphasized his humanity. It emphasized his ability, his capacity to function as our great high priest, Hebrews chapter 5. Whatever a person might bring forward, okay, whatever a person has to say as it concerns why God made people the way he did, right, limited and suffering and subject to sorrow and death, whatever the reason, a person can never say that God didn't have the honesty, the integrity, and the courage to take his own medicine. God had exacted nothing from man that he did not exact from himself in the person of Christ. Understand that Jesus himself, he has gone through the whole spectrum of human experience, from the trivial irritations of family life and and the cramping restrictions of, of hard work and lack of money to the unspeakable horrors of pain and humiliation and defeat and death that, that we're beginning to read about here. When God became a man in the person of Jesus, he went all in, right? Jesus played the man. One of, this things that this, one of the things that this does for us is it qualifies him to be our great high priest. When, when you are reaching out and, and you are crying out to God in your hour of need, understand that you are not reaching out. You are not crying out to some aloof deity in the sky. That, that God gets you. He gets it. He's been there. He's done that. He, he has the t-shirt In the person of Christ. In the person of Christ, God has experienced the full depth of the human experience. Hebrews 4.15. You are crying out to a sympathetic, merciful God that gets you, knows you, has all your hair follicles numbered, has more thoughts about you than you will ever count, Psalm 139. He knows you better than yourself. He made you. God gets you. You're not crying out to some some far-off concept of an unknowable God. That's not what the Bible presents. It presents a God that is deeply in tune with you at the micro level, and he gets you and loves you. The human side, that's the son of man. 
And that's a concept that's not too difficult for us to grasp. Then you've got the divine side, the Son of God. And this is what they're really asking him in verse 70. Are are you the Son of God? And this gets a little more interesting. Now understand that you and I, we are sons and daughters of the living God. If you have been born of the Spirit, right? If you've come to the saving knowledge of Christ, we are the sons and daughters of God. But we are adopted sons and daughters. Jesus alone, the Bible says, is the only begotten of the Father. Now, you who are parents, if you, if you have begotten children, birth children, your children share in your image. That's why they look like you. Your children, they, they bear forth and share in your very nature. <laughs> That's their problem, right? That's why they act the way they do, because they have your nature. You're a bit goofy, and so, so are they. Now, Jesus, he is the only begotten Son of God, which means he shares in uniquely the Father's nature. You remember, he said, I and the Father are one. He he shares uniquely in the Father's nature. And that's what's making these guys go berserk and ballistic in verse 70. He is claiming that, now we're not talking about a superhero here. We're, We're talking about sharing the nature of God without beginning, without end, right? All powerful, all knowing, all seeing. Christ is sharing in that nature. So so they're saying, do you mean to say to us? And now notice, guys, this is where the beatings become a part of their plan. Do you really mean to tell this court that you, you, this broken, beaten, nothing, pauper, peasant, humiliated, non-combative person, you are saying that you, that, what? That you share in the very nature of the living God? Look at you. You're telling us that you are the son of the living God? And Jesus says, well, yeah. Yes, I am. You see, they didn't get who Jesus was. They did not understand what he came to do. And for that matter, there's a lot of us that are in the dark. And that's why this is so instructive. The Jews could never reconcile their own Hebrew scriptures. Their own Hebrew scriptures presented a a duality, and they couldn't reconcile it. In the one sense, their scriptures presented the Messiah as one ruling and reigning, Isaiah 11, Psalm 72, many others. But then uh, other passages presented the Messiah as a suffering servant, as a man of sorrows, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, Daniel 9. They, They couldn't reconcile these two natures. Now, how do you reconcile? Sell these two natures, and now we're getting somewhere because here comes the Christ part, right? The, the Christos, the Messiah who saves. These two natures are perfectly, beautifully reconciled in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what they could have known, man. This is what they should have known. He, he taught this to his disciples. But again, their hearts had already made the decision and checked out long ago, and now their minds are in tow. Are you following that? They don't want to know. And so Jesus says there in verse 67, what's, what's the point? You're not going to believe. Now, here's where this all comes together in our understanding. Dial in here. Because salvation involves the redeeming of physical time-oriented human beings unto an eternal timeless state, the one to make that possible, the Messiah, would have to be capable of having a duplicity of nature. He would have to have this dual nature in order to lay a hold of man and lay a hold of eternity and bring these two together. What am I saying? He would have to be the Son of Man and the Son of God. Are you starting to grab this? And so this is the duplicity that Jesus alone possesses that enables him to now redeem finite men and women into the infinite eternal realm. But there's one catch. He has to die in their place to make this effectual 
And again, that's why he's going through all of this, right? Now, understand, technically, Bible students, he cannot become the Christ, the Christos, the Messiah who saves, that cannot technically become effectual until he goes to the cross. Because that's where the saving happens, right? So the Son of Man and the Son of God, these two natures are brought together effectually to bring about salvation for humanity at the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's why he answers this way in verse 69. But from now on, this phrase means immediately hereafter. The idea is as soon as you guys do what you're going to do, in that moment at the cross, I am the Christ who saves, and I am then going to be elevated to power at the right hand of God, which, of course, is what Daniel prophesied in Daniel 7. That transaction at the cross, listen, That transaction at the cross will be where and when the sacrifice of the Son of God, having chosen the Son of God, chosen to become the sinless Son of Man, can then really ratify and make make effectual our salvation. Okay? C.S. Lewis says this, and it brings it all together much simpler. But I, I want us to see this duality that Christ alone has to bring finite, time-oriented man into the eternal, infinite state. He has Son of Man, Son of God, Son of Man. He alone can bring these th- two things together at the cross. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He says, you see, the Son of God became a man... The Son of God became a man to enable men to become sons of God. The Son of God became a man to enable men to become sons of God. Look, it is important for you, and I, 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 don't, I don't get all this stuff. I, I mean, the gospel is a profound mystery. And it's important for you and I to, to gaze into and, and peer into and, and press into into an understanding of the gospel. As I've said before, the gospel is this beautiful prism, this valuable diamond, this unspeakably profound mystery that as you turn it and look at it, you begin to see different angles of light and and insights and, and, and the wonders of its many facets, and you grow in your understanding. God wants you to know who he is and what he's done. He wants you to know just how it is. He has made a way for you to be right before him. This is crazy important stuff for the Christian to know. Seek always to not make the gospel old hat. Take it. It's beautiful. It's perfect. It's timeless. It's eternal. Turn it. Gaze at it. Look at it that you might grow in your appreciation of it in order that you might, Christian, be made to delight in order that you might then be transformed because suddenly sin isn't so great anymore in the heart of the maturing believer, is it? Now, Before all this happens, of course, Christ has to get jerked around quite a bit more. On now to the first of the three trials, the three civil trials before Rome, on to Stone Temple Pilate here, uh, verse 1 of chapter 23. Then the whole body, verse 1, chapter 23, then the whole body, this would be the Sanhedrin, The whole body of them got up and brought him before Pilate, and they began, this phrase, they began, in the Greek it means they began and they didn't stop, all right? And they began to accuse him, saying, we found this man. Now, here we have the three indictments that they're bringing before Rome, okay? Three indictments. We found this man, number one, misleading our nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, number two. And number three, saying that he himself is the Christ, a king. Now understand that Pilate could care less about the first two, so he says in verse three. So Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, It is as you say. Then Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. And we'll understand why this is. Oh, wow, Pilate's jumping the gun pretty quick here, isn't it? Well, there's some detail in John's gospel that we'll look at in a minute. It is as you say, then Pilate said to the chief priests and crowds, I find no guilt in this man. Should be over. Shortest trial in Roman history, right? But, verse 5, they, they, these guys aren't going to give up. 
They kept on insisting. Very strong phrase there, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching all over Judea, starting from Galilee. Now, that ding, 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 this is a dinger for Pilate. From Galilee, even as far as this place. Now, that gets Pilate's attention when he hears Galilee. Verse 6, When Pilate heard it, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction... He sent him to Herod, who himself was also in Jerusalem at the time. Again, both of these guys are in time to quell any potential rebellions during the Passover. Now, back up there in verse 2, we have the three indictments that the Jews were seeking to bring before Pilate. Knowing Pilate could give a rip about the Jewish law, they're trying to frame these in a way that would suggest undermining the Roman rule. Again, the first two indictments, they're ridiculous. Jesus wasn't trying to incite the Jews against Rome. He wasn't trying to incite the Jews against their own sin. Secondly, if you remember back there in chapter 20, they asked him about paying taxes to Rome, and what did Jesus say? Render unto Caesar's what is Caesar's. So a patently false indictment there. Now, the third indictment, and the one that gets Pilate's attention, and and so he asks Jesus in verse 3, are you king of the Jews? And again, man, you got, you've got to get your mind inside the word of God. Have an appreciation for this scene. Picture this scene. You've got maybe a bit of sarcasm here in Pilate's voice. Here is Christ standing before him, right? Beat up and bloodied and dirty and swollen. And he has dehydrated. He's been up for 24 hours. What do you look like when you've been up for 24 hours, let alone the deal that he's just been? I mean, Pilate's looking at this guy. Is this what you interrupted my breakfast for? Is this a joke? This guy here, and so he's looking at Jesus. You're telling me this guy, are you the are you the king of the Jews? Now, John's gospel unpacks a little more of this conversation for us between Jesus and Pilate. Let's take a look at it. Therefore, Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you king of the Jews? And Jesus now, he he understands that he and Pilate don't have, they're not on the same page with this term king. So he begins to kind of draw this out of him. Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? And it cracks me up what Pilate says here. I I am not a Jew. Am I a Jew? I mean, come on, how would I know this stuff? Your, Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? Now Jesus has drawn him in because he doesn't want Pilate to think that he is a king in an earthly sense, in a military sense. He knows that Pilate's not going to get his kingship. So he says this in verse 36. Jesus answered and said, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. So, so Jesus, if I might paraphrase this, he's saying, look, this is a pretty tricky question for me, and you're not going to get it. Yes, I am a king, but my kingdom does not have the characteristics of an earthly kingdom as you are thinking, because if it did, you'd see a huge army outside there fighting for me. I, this is not a military kingdom seeking to impinge upon Rome's authority. That's what he's saying there in verse 36. Back to Luke then, he says in verse 3, it is as you say. So all of that happened before that it is as you say. Okay? Now, Pilate may be a weasel. Pilate may be a man of compromise. All right? And we'll see this particularly the next time we get together here in Luke 23. But the man is not stupid. Both Matthew and Mark tell us that Pilate knows the score on these Jews. He knows, according to Matthew and Mark, that they are bringing Jesus before him to be executed out of envy. Pilate understands, look, this this is the kind of thing they've wanted for years. If they want to kill this guy, he must be a threat to them. This must be politically motivated, and he was right. And so he says in verse 4, you know what? Not guilty. I find no fault in this man. There it is. Should have been the shortest trial in Roman history right there. And it would have been if Pilate had a spine. 
But we'll see that next week. He doesn't. This is not a man with any core conviction up against people whom he is to govern over, to rule over, who have a very strong set of core convictions, and, and he's going to snap. Okay? So these guys go, he said, what? Should have been the shortest trial ever. Uh, for these guys go nuts in verse 5. No, no, no. You don't understand, man. This man stirs up the people. Now, the idea in the Greek here is that he incites people against Rome. So he is stirring up the people from Galilee all the way down here to Judea. Now, again, Galilee, that's the second thing that grabs Pilate's attention because now Pilate the weasel, Pilate the man of compromise, he sees a way out of this. I can just pawn this guy off to Herod. Galilee is Herod's jurisdiction. I'm going to let him deal with this, and I'm going to get back to my breakfast burrito. Now, who was Herod? Herod was nothing more than a Roman puppet right? These guys were, were governors appointed by Rome. This particular Herod is Herod Antipas. This is the guy that put John in prison, right? His father was Herod the Great. Now, again, the only reason these guys are in town is to quell any potential Jewish rebellion during the Passover. So off to Herod here in verse 8, and this is going to take us home for today, and it's going to get awesome. Here we go. Now Herod, notice, was very glad when he saw Jesus. Very glad, uh, for he had wanted to see him for a long time because he had been hearing about him. And notice, hoping to see some sign performed by him. And he questioned him at length, at some length, but he answered him nothing. That's huge. He didn't say a word to this guy. And the chief priests, and I'm sure that didn't make him real happy, and the chief priests and the scribes were standing there accusing him vehemently, and Herod with his soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe. This would have been the kind of robe that a a candidate for Roman office would have worn, uh, very regal, uh, mockingly so, and and sent him back to Pilate. Verse 12, (laughs) interesting. Now Herod and Pilate became buddies with one another that very day, for before they had been enemies. Well, imagine that. Now they're buddies. Because they have a, a kind of, they're, they're partners in crime, aren't they? Blasphemy tends to unite the fallen nations, doesn't it? Now, Herod, notice that Herod was, he was very excited about Jesus coming. He, he was anticipating, oh, goody, I'm going to see a rabbit pop out of the hat. David Copperfield is coming to my office. David Blaine is coming to my office. This is going to be absolutely awesome. Now you remember that Herod is a guy who liked to talk about spiritual things. Herod loved him a good sermon. All right, I mean, this guy was a guy that loved to talk about the Bible. We're told that he would visit John in prison and he would hear John gladly. Now, now why was John in prison? Uh, because this doofus here locked him up because John called him out and he didn't want to bring forth obedience to the Word of God, right? This is a man, listen, that wanted to listen to truth, but he had absolutely, absolutely no appetite for living truth. He wanted to hear it, didn't want to do it, James 1.22. Now, isn't it incredible that here you have a man who loves to listen to the Word of God but has no appetite to do the Word of God? Isn't it interesting? Mark it there in verse 9. Jesus has nothing to say to this guy at all. Isn't that interesting? Jesus has nothing to say to a man that has no desire to do the Word of God. And what an indictment that is against those of us who are hearers only. If we do not have a desire to take the Word of God and put it to work in our lives, we should not be all that surprised to not be hearing from God. Now, here I'd like to listen to a good sermon but not for spiritual insight, right? Mark it there at the end of verse 8. 
He wanted to be entertained. He was looking for signs and wonders. You read about Herod. You discover pretty quickly entertainment was what this guy's life was all about. And so we have Luke here. And by the way, the only gospel writer that records this trial before Herod. And we have Luke painting a very powerful picture here. What is that picture? If you are seeking Jesus for carnal reasons, if you are going to church for entertainment, all right, if you are seeking some kind of religious experience where it's all about you and every sermon is designed not to convict you but but just to make you feel all awesome about yourself, you know, if you see yourself at the center of every sermon, you're just looking for some kind of experiential um, spiritual buzz, then one of two things things is going to happen. Okay? And by the way, if that's what you're after, you're obviously in the wrong place. But the good news is there are plenty of churches that serve that three-ring circus up for you. But, but if you are coming after Jesus carnally, if you're looking to make church all about how awesome you are, if you're seeking spiritual entertainment, one of two things is going to be coming your way. No Jesus or a false Jesus. What do you mean by that? Well, I'll tell you. If I am looking to Christ to meet all of my carnal desires, I am either going to be met with silence or I'm going to be met with this. This is Christ himself speaking. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead. The ESV has lead astray. The NIV has deceive. False Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, deceive, lead astray. If possible, even the elect believers Paul tells the church at Thessalonica, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, if you do not love the truth, you are a target for the lying signs and wonders of the devil. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10. Your enemy, and a lot of people don't know this, particularly the charismatic movement seems to be ignorant of this scriptural truth. Your enemy will serve up all the wow you want if he can keep you out of God's word. He'll wow your socks off if he can keep you out of God's word. Understand that. Look, I want you to be prepared. I care very deeply that the people that are part of this local assembly of believers, that you are not deceived, that you are not led astray. That is not, obviously, the will of God for your life. And it's with that thought that we're going to land the plane. At the end of the day here, right, when, when all is said and done, what in the world was it that allowed Jesus to endure the painful beatings that we're, we're just beginning to read about here? Because I understand this was not a pleasant experience, and it's about to get a whole lot worse, a whole lot worse. What was it that allowed Jesus to ultimately move now forward through the horrors of this ordeal? What in the, how did he do this? Ultimately, it was his explicit trust in the Father. That his Father knows what he's doing. And here's where, man, we get caught up and we stumble. We, we don't trust. He sat back there in the garden of Gethsemane just moments before this. Man, this is a tough road, Dad. I sure wish there was a plan B because, man, I would jump all over it. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. I, I trust that your will is in my best eternal interest. Now, you and I, this week, this year, 
over and over again, there are a number of decisions and scenarios that are going to be coming our way where you and I have to make a decision. Is it going to be my will and and what I think is going to usher me into happiness? Or am I going to trust my creator and the lover of my soul who has all of eternity in view with my best welfare at heart? What's it going to be? Just is literally one of hundreds of examples, and one of the examples I see more often than I'd like to. You got a wife, she's married to this jerk of a husband, no poking. He is not loving her well, he's not paying attention to her heart and her needs, and all of a sudden, a guy comes out of left field who begins to give her a little attention. He's laying on the compliments and notices when she gets her hair cut and the unemployed idiot back, out the back there on the couch watching swamp people. You know, he, he doesn't know when she's getting her hair cut. And one of the things about you and I, we are great salesmen, are we not? Again, the heart decides, then the head begins to sell itself on what it is the heart has decided. And so the wife here, she begins to sell herself on the idea that, look, doesn't God want me to be happy doesn't God want me to be, be fulfilled? I mean, I'm thinking God wants me to ditch the loser out there back there on the couch. And she begins to sell herself on the idea that it's God's will for her to divorce this guy. No, no. You know what the will of God is. The, the will of God is for you to be committed to the marriage. The will of God is for you to be committed to those kids. You stood before God and you said for better or for worse. Now, if you don't go for what the word of God says in that example, what do you get? The lady eventually ends up marrying another goofball and starts the whole process over of discovering the multiple and deep flaws of another human being. That's just one example. Just one. Look, the will of God is not hard to figure out. The will of God is the word of God. And the word of God is to reveal to you and I how it is that we are to live. All through the course of our lives, we are going to be facing situations where I know what the will of God is for my life. The will of God is for me to head in this direction over here, but I am looking down the tunnel of that direction, and I think, you know what? Me no likey. You know, I don't think I want to sign up for that deal. Now, this other direction, now that direction right there. Now, that is a direction I think I could seek my teeth into. Now, look, our problem is we just don't trust God. God says, now, look, man, don't be deceived. Don't lean on your own understanding. You just trust me and just watch what I'm going to do with your life. Watch how I will bless. Watch what I am able to do with the very difficulties I've allowed to be, to, to be set before you. How dark is this hour in the life of Christ? How dark it doesn't get any darker than this. And yet, out of that utter darkness, yet God knows what he's doing. And out of that what is he going to do? He's going to redeem and restore Jesus to the right hand of the power of God. He is going to provide the effectual vehicle for salvation for all of humanity out of this dark hour. And the joy that he is setting before the one who was in this dark hour, his joy is, and in fact, is to this day unspeakably glorious and eternal. How do we somehow think that God can't handle whatever it is that is going on in our lives? Come on. Come on. Get off it. Do you see what has come from this hour of darkness? Are you and I sitting here today? God is not, God is not breaking out in a sweat over what you're going through. God is not up there scratching his head with furrowed brow saying, how in the world am I going to fix this deal? No, no. God is confidently reigning upon the throne of the universe. He knows absolutely what he's doing in your life if you will just but trust the creator of your soul, the lover 
of your soul and the revealed word that he has given you to lead us unto flourishing. You don't have to flourish. Try your own way. Lean on your own understanding. Compromise. You will never break out of that cycle of hurt and despair. This week, let us just trust in the Lord. Lean not upon our own flawed understanding. In all our ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. The Bible says he will bless your life with all of eternity in view. You have no idea what God can begin to do in your life if you just go all in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you. Time and time again, you rescue our, uh, you rescue our deceived souls. Every one of us in this room, Lord, we are broken before your holiness. And God, we need your help. We don't see rightly. We're we're blind. There is a thousand upon thousands of blindnesses in this room. Many, my own. Lord, would you allow the light of your word of God by the power of your spirit to just burn away the smoke screen and and, and illuminate the darkness. Cause us, Lord, to trust in you and not lean upon our, our very flawed understanding. You are holy. You are eternal. You know the score. You've seen the end of the movie. You've got it all wired if we will but trust. Help our lack of trust. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. All right, let's worship.